my piece looks at, uh, initially, what remains, even in the digital age, the most popular leisure activity for teenagers, and that is television watching. So it's the same thing, it's roughly, estimates vary three to four hours a day. And uh, I, I contrast uh, television watching roughly in 1970 with television watching today for teenagers. And there is a drastic difference. Uh, and the difference is nicely you know, illustrated by what I did. I went back to TV Guide in May 1970. I said, okay, what, what happens when a 15-year-old comes home from school and turns on the TV in Atlanta? And the first thing you would notice is there are only five TV stations, uh, which seems to uh, a, a digital native these days is a, I mean, a, an astonishingly primitive and impoverished environment. But three stations were showing soap operas, The Secret Storm, Another World, and General Hospital before the Luke and Laura era, <laughs> uh, which started appealing to college students a little later. Uh, you had the Merv Griffin show, and you had Rocket Robin Hood, which was a, a cartoon for kids. I looked the rest of the day, and you only had one TV show that appealed to teens in terms of showing teens, and that was the Patty Duke show. That was it. All the other shows that might have appealed to teens, like Gilligan's Island, uh, came on, uh, Get Smart, you know, wacky comedies that they made. Like, they didn't star teenagers or older people playing teenagers, which is often the case. So when a 15-year-old would come home after spending all day in school, packed in with, with all these peers, uh, or playing for an hour or two after school with the peers, you go home and your peer world pretty much ends. You don't, you're not surrounded by your own age group anymore. If you jump ahead after the advent of cable in the early 80s up to today, and you turn on the TV at 3 o'clock and you're 15 years old, you've got a dozen stations showing teen-oriented programs with teens starring in them. You can go on to On Demand uh, in Comcast, where I'm, where I'm in Atlanta. You can find teen movies, three or four options, all the time. And this goes on all hours of the day. So now the most popular leisure activity, which before wasn't teen oriented, now is. You've got mirrors of adolescence surrounding teens all the time. At school, real peers, when they get home and turn on the TV, two dimensional peers in fantasy situations often, uh, and the digital age, obviously, with all the social networking going on. So it can really become a 24-7 peer-to-peer contact world. You can get intense age segregation uh, taking place. Now, okay, well, well, what's wrong with that? Well, one thing that, that I, I agree with uh, the editors and a lot of the contributors is that many of these mass culture programming do contain uh, moral dimensions. And in their plots, we can actually often agree with the moral thrust of those plots. One, uh, one example would be about 10 years ago, the most popular movie among late teens and early teens, I guess, was The Blair Witch Project. It starred three, I mean, everyone here remembers that it's a little video uh, project, three early film school students going out into an area outside in the countryside in Maryland to try to track down the Blair Witch, a local legend of some witch living out in the woods, some things happened, and they're going to track it down and, and find out about it. So it portrays them going off into this community, then going off into the woods, and bad things end up happening to them. Uh, they were, the actors are like early 20s, mid 20s, but they're acting like teenagers. They, they bicker with one another, they talk the way 19 year olds would talk. And so it appealed to teenagers at the same time. Now, here's the thing. You get a lot of frivolous behavior, a lot of adolescence going on, but when you look at the course of the plot, you find some very strong moral violations that these kids commit, they go into a local community and they kind of are irreverent and they're make fun, making fun of people who live in this small rural area. 
they talk about this legend, a local legend, a local custom, the thing things remember, their sense of the past in this local way, and they're laughing at it. And they're going to come out and debunk it. They're going to bring their postmodern irreverence, their sarcasm and irony to this little community and explode it uh, and represent it on camera and bring it back to, to the world. So they go out into uh, the landscape to track this down and they find themselves starting to get lost uh, out in the countryside and they are starting to get worried. And it gradually drifts into a very unfunny situation and they feel someone is starting to track them. Things don't start going wrong until they come upon an area marked out in sort of some trees, and it looks like maybe a burial ground, some kind of sacred space. There are these strange X's up in the trees that someone has constructed, and they even talk about it as some sacred space. And what do they do? They go in and they vandalize it. They cross a line okay, showing their disrespect for the dead, disrespect for tradition, disrespect for others' lives, and they end up suffering for that. Okay. So there you can see they've done something wrong. Okay. They have violated civilized norms. They have violated some conservative principles about tradition and the past and, and, and respect. One often finds this, actually, in horror films. How often is it the, the boy and girl, the 17-year-olds, they go off somewhere they shouldn't go, they're going to make out for a while, they're transgressing, and they end up suffering for it. That's the, those, who, those who transgress end up being you know, the ghost or the you know, monster or whatever gets them. So there's an undercurrent, uh, a moral undercurrent, that we can endorse. Here's the problem, though, that, that, that I would add. When you have adolescents being flooded with pictures of themselves, dramatizations of themselves, representations of themselves, even if you can sense a moral undercurrent in the plots, it freezes them into an adolescent condition. It makes them overemphasize this point in their lives and hold on to it. It makes them get too caught up in representations of being 17, 16 years old, and that instead of understanding adolescence as, I'm just moving into adulthood, I'm not stopping here, and I don't want to stay here for very long. I want to get out. I want to be a grown-up. I have an ambition to be independent when they are surrounded with friends, with peers, with representations of adolescence that intensifies the drama, that elevates the ordinary, trivial triumphs and catastrophes of adolescence into such you know, uh, dignity and integrity that they make national TV shows and movies about them. My concern is that it slows the maturing process. It locks them too much into the tragedies and, and the celebrations of the schoolyard, of the mall food court, of, of the high school football game, and that these things simply acquire too much importance just by the volume that they are, are encountering in their, in their teenage lives these days. So, and that's my warning to parents <laughs> as the essay concludes. <laughs>